Over the last few days, one of the biggest discussions on the internet has been Quiet On Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV, the new documentary from Investigation Discovery. This is an expansive docuseries detailing a litany of systemic abuses and misconduct that many child actors on Nickelodeon shows during the late 90s and early 2000s had to suffer consistently. And at the center of the investigation is Dan Schneider, a name you've probably heard of if you're a fan of any of these series. All that. The Amanda Show, iCarly, Sam and Cat, Good Burger. Dan Schneider has long been rumored over the years to have contributed to a charge and at times inappropriate work environment with many clips and videos calling into question his judgment on multiple series involving minors. But the series also goes into multiple other issues at Nickelodeon, including other predatory cast and crew members who ended up interacting with said minors on set and doing damage. I highly recommend you watch the series. It's thorough, it's direct, and it has a ton of insane revelations. You have to see how they've laid out to really get the gravity of what's going on. And that gravity and those revelations have prompted a wide range of public responses, including an apology from Schneider himself. We'll get to that. Now, many people are attributing this to a pervasive culture around Hollywood. There are definitely issues with Hollywood, but I think there's a really, really important discussion we should have around power dynamics in this as well. So let's break down what we found out from Quiet on Set, the revelations, some of the responses, and what it truly tells us about this industry and the dynamics people exhibit in power at large. And I'm going to say this ahead of time. This video deals with a lot of heavy stuff. I'm issuing that content warning now. I'm not going to go into too much pervasive detail or this video will get torpedoed and it won't be seen by anybody. But I think it's an important discussion to have about the aftermath of all of these things so far. That being said, here we go. Let's start with the writer's room. So Dan Schneider is hired as the head writer and producer to build out all that after he made the hit head of the class. All that obviously is the juggernaut sketch show, which would become the SNL for kids, launching the careers of people like Keenan Thompson, Nick Cannon, Amanda Bynes. Good Burger was originally a sketch on all that. Now listen, Schneider was initially seen as a fun and goofy kind of guy on set until he slowly started to become more intimidating and aggressive. Also, at times, many of the jokes on all that felt inappropriate for a show starring kids as if Dan was quietly trying to weave in very adult humor into this show is different about this they, they gave me a prosthetic nose like an enlarged nose and they put this same nose on the costume I can't what are your special powers you can't help but notice that it looks like <laughs> on my shoulders <laughs> And the joke in that sketch is effectively a shot joke. It's a shot joke for children. Now, shortly into all that, Schneider discovered Amanda Bynes, who immediately seemed like a rocket ship. He eventually put her on all that, where she was absolutely a hit, and then she got her own spinoff, The Amanda Show. It should also be pointed out that Dan tended to play favorites with different cast members. We'll get to that in a minute. The Amanda Show is a huge success. It is a breakthrough female sketch show in the 90s starring a kid. That's, regardless of what you feel about it, that is a monumental achievement, especially for the time. Which is why the allegations from the first two women on the writing staff of The Amanda Show for the first season are so absolutely troubling. It was early on when we first started that Dan said he didn't think women were funny. He said women can't write funny. He challenged us to name a funny female writer. And he said this to the writers in the writer's room. And that was my first indication of trouble. This is wild. Also, it should be said that Schneider made them split a salary down the middle. Originally, I was pretty like taken aback by that. But I called my friend who is one of the higher up members of the WGA. That's actually normal. You can hire writers as a team into those specific spots. Now, whether the show had a requirement with the WGA at the time to hire a single writer and whether they were splitting that, there's some contention about that overall. Oh, okay, I should probably mention this. Uh, that also happens just randomly throughout the documentary. There will be massive allegations about Dan Schneider, and then a random black card will come up with Dan Schneider like issuing a denial. Like if I was to say, uh, Dan Schneider is a lizard in a person suit. See, 
Great job, Dan. Also, Dan would weave in significantly inappropriate jokes into those writers' meetings. And even more fucked up is that more adult jokes did directly find their way into the Amanda show. Jenny Kilgan describes Penelope Tain, a well-known Amanda show character who's kind of uptight, kind of, you know, strict, bookworm, by the rules kind of person. Her last name was Taint. I thought it was Tate when I was growing up. It's Taint, meant to indicate a certain part on the human body. This was directly told to the writer. And when the Nickelodeon executives called Schneider, Schneider was like, no, 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 it means to taint something or make it bad. Uh? Remember that, it'll be important for later. Eventually, Schneider fires Chrissy Stratton, the other female writer, for taking one or two days off extra than she should. Schneider was also accused of making people work all the time on clock. He then offered Jenny a contract for the second season for 16 weeks, but saying that she had to work 27, 11 of those for free. And in the first meeting back, he called Jenny into his office, had a bunch of male writers behind him, and this happened. I pitched my idea, and he said, didn't you used to do phone sex? Just like that, like out of nowhere. I was like, no, Dan. He was like, didn't you tell us, didn't you say that last season that you used to have a job like that, something like that? No. I was destroyed. I went outside, I was crying. I can't do this. So I did, I went home and I quit. <laughs> and it was so devastating, it was so hard to let go of that job, but. Fucking abysmal. That is bad, but it leads to so much worse with Schneider creating a kid's version of Fear Factor called On Air Dare. Now. Of course, when you just hear that, you're like, oh, that seems insane to make kids do Fear Factor. More insane when, hey, the rebooted cast of all that is forced into doing Fear Factor. Multiple times those kids felt uncomfortable and said they were abused. Some of them even testifying on camera. Remember what I said about favoritism? Multiple black actors saying Dan felt dismissive of their concerns on set, including black parents of black actors who expressed concern at some of the sketches and the content of those sketches. Oh, Tracy, shh, 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 go, go. I was complaining too much. I became the oddball. Dan treated Brian with caution, like he side-eyed him. And what happened? That actor was fired after his second season with his mother alleging that they were seen as difficult. Brian wasn't being invited back. But I also kind of felt like the times that my mom was, you know, raising hell, that maybe that had a lot to do with the collective decision to kick me off. It was get them out of here. And that's Hollywood but I wasn't prepared for that. But the biggest bombshells everybody is talking about are the ones made by Drake Bell against Brian Peck, an actor who was convicted of S-A-ing Drake when he was a minor prior to Drake and Josh. Brian Peck was a regular on all that. He was also a well-known dialogue coach around the industry. You can find videos of him hanging out with Leonardo DiCaprio. He's on a bunch of other television shows. He's the pickle guy and all that. Now here's the thing. Drake's name at the time of the lawsuit was never made public. This documentary made it public. But Peck was said to have driven a wedge between Drake and his father, who was the manager at the time, in order for Peck to take on that role. I think Brian got a sense that my dad was on the watch. And so he started to really drive a wedge between my dad and me. He started talking about how my dad's stealing my money. Nobody likes that my dad's on set. He's a real problem. After that, Drake had stayed at his mom for about a week, and then I got a phone call from his mom saying, Drake doesn't want you to be his manager anymore. Drake, who lived in Orange County, decided to stay with his mother, and his mom doesn't want to drive him up to L.A. to do the pilot or auditions or any of that other stuff. So here comes Peck saying, hey, I'll pick you up. You can come over to my place and stay the night when you're going out to do work and this pilot and everything like that. And we can work on dialogue and writing and it'll be a good time. Okay. And it doesn't take a genius to see how bad this situation is. By the way, Drake's father told her about not letting him alone with Brian Peck. And I'm not going to blame Drake's mom, obviously. Like, if your child is hit by that, you have to blame yourself in so many different ways. But Drake goes through it in multiple horrific, abusive ways. I cannot say what's happened. Even the documentary doesn't go into explicit detail said out loud. Pretty brutal. Pretty brutal. Um... Ah. <sighs> 
I don't know, uh, I really don't know how to, uh, um, elaborate on that on, on camera, really. And when Peck is finally caught, Drake arrives at the trial to find that he's being supported by like 40 big Hollywood actors, including names like Will Friedle and Ryder Strong. They've written letters in support of him. And listen, Brian Peck was a well-respected person amongst a lot of people. Multiple people didn't even know this happened. One of the red flags even discussed in the documentary is they go to Brian's house and he shows them that he has a self-portrait from John Wayne Gacy. And to many people, it feels like, oh, that's a red flag. But Brian's a good guy. He couldn't do this. D dude, obviously, all of those people feel shitty for that. And through all of this hurricane, Drake says that his biggest supporter at Nickelodeon through all of this was Dan Schneider. Now, that is a that is a ton to get through. And the impropriety here is worse than originally imagined from rumors that we've been seeing all over the years with Ariana Grande and the potato. And a lot of it's more pervasive and dangerous and there are more allegations of people being hurt. But let's go through the responses because there are many to all of this. Nickelodeon obviously issued a response both in the documentary and after it aired. In the challenges of production, Dan could get frustrated at times and he understands why some employees found that intimidating or stressful. In a career spanning 30 years, Dan worked with thousands of people, many of whom still tell him how much they enjoyed and appreciated working on his shows, but he also knows some people did not have a positive experience, and he's truly sorry for that. Remember, all stories, dialogue, costumes, and makeup were fully approved by network executives on two coasts. A standards and practices group read and ultimately approved every script, and programming executives reviewed and approved all episodes. Had there been any scenes or outfits that were inappropriate in any way, they would have been flagged and blocked by this multi-layered scrutiny. Bro. Remember what I said about media literacy? I think Nick needs to learn a little bit about that because the whole point of the documentary is that there was parents on set. Of course, there is going to be multi-layered scrutiny before this stuff goes out. The documentary alleges that all of this happened and the barriers that were there to protect these kids failed. The kids themselves are speaking out and it's not one or two like disgruntled kids. It's multiple people. You even settled a lawsuit in which Dan was sued for sexism. That's more than just I'm frustrated by the long work hours. That's you were sexist and made fucked up jokes, dude. You were shitty. Honestly, Snyder's upcoming response is better than this. The president of content and production at Nickelodeon, Russell Hicks, defended Snyder overall, saying things like people seem to be forgetting is the fact that the network has a talent management department that is keeping tabs on everything that is happening and going to every event these kids go to. Yeah, but dude, there are multiple predatory people that were caught on these sets. Remember Brian Peck? He's one of two that ended up getting caught and going to jail. The other guy was a well-known crew member. Amy Berg also commented saying that she never witnessed any inappropriate behavior on set, but that Schneider was a fucking asshole and gave her a ton of health problems and that crunch. But there are three pretty big responses that everybody's talking about. The first is from Ned's Declassified star, Devin Workheiser, which he posted on his lot. Daniel, we told you never to speak about that. Get back in your hole, Daniel. And give me your holes. Sorry, we shouldn't joke about this. We really shouldn't. Uh, and no, it's fucking awful. The 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 Drake Bell shit is a cr like that's crazy to hear. I I that is fucked, man. No. Guys, we can't joke like this. Jesus, guys, we're 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 sometimes humor helps us move through things. Yeah, you know, hundred percent. Not a good look, Devin. Look, I get it. People laugh in the face of like trauma to deal with it. That's absolutely valid, but they don't put it on live. And they don't put it on live when it's such a sensitive subject and the victim has just been publicly outed after being silent for so long. Drake even responded calling him Ned's declassless. Will Friedel and Ryder Strong declined to participate in the documentary and said doing a podcast where they spoke on their relationship with Brian Peck saying that they were groomed and that they were forced into writing that letter, that they felt like they were going to die when Drake's mother approached them and they, and they just had to stay silent, that they didn't know the extent of it. However, Drake Bell has pushed back on all of that in an Instagram comment saying that Will was 27 at the time and didn't bring any of that up to him when they were working together on Ultimate Spider-Man. And that is not great, bro. I... <sighs> 
I really like Wilfred Dell, man, and I want to be, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, but like, dude, I will say that the documentarians say that like a lot of Ryder and Freydell's responses mimic certain responses that Bell gave without them seeing the documentary. That could be an indication that they may have experienced similar things. And of course, some of those abuses last well into your life, but that's that's still not a great look, Will. Like, regardless. It's, this is such a this is a shitty situation. Now, obviously, the sun around this whole thing is Dan Schneider. All of these instances and problems happened under his watch. To his credit. Schneider posted a 19-minute apology video that he sent to The Hollywood Reporter. In it, he takes accountability for being shitty at times and not a great boss and says sorry if he gave people a bad work experience. The problem is, the person interviewing Dan is clearly on his side. Let's start with the good. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw, not cool. No. No, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but if I can cut right to the chase, let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room, ever, period, the end, no excuses. Um, most TV writers, comedy writers have been in writer's rooms and they are aware that a lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. Uh, but the fact that I participated in that, especially when I was leading the room, um, it embarrasses me, I shouldn't have done it. In the writer's room, there's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale and I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far and um, that was wrong and that that was because you know I was an inexperienced producer I was immature wouldn't happen today but um, I'm just really sorry it happened obviously solid on accountability if you take your biases out of this of which I have a lot against Dan Schneider this is a pretty solid response that you would draft for anybody to have and apologize for. Like, you know how people super scrutinize apologies? This is a full accountability of apology right there. Hey, I was shitty. I've grown a lot. I'm really sorry for putting you through that. Keep going. You've written hundreds of episodes. Thousands of jokes have been told. Yeah. The writers of yours, two women, mm -hmm. who spoke about a wage discrepancy. Now, I know that you don't divvy out salaries. Something that really kind of bothered me was how they depicted your relationship with the cast. Yeah, it bothered me too. Yeah, just me being there, I knew the dynamic was trust. Do you see what's happening here? The guy across from him is Boogie, who played Tebow on iCarly. Th this guy is giving off, hey kids, we've all been through a lot today. I've seen a lot of really scary stuff. I know it's hard for you to process this with your childlike, adult brains because if you were to watch these shows you would probably be adults now but i'm ignoring that to just try to play into the kids thing for a minute i'm here with dan and dan is playing into this like hey ha huh, man this is rough dan you once told a female writer to bend over and act like a really inappropriate act was being committed to her what do you say that was bad and i feel really bad about it and i'm sorry and man the work environment's really tough and a pressure cooker oh golly gee and listen I can take that you have blind spots and that the environment was different and that you regret the boys club that you made, but you keep undercutting your accountability by little bits and pieces. If nobody on the set, if all of the dozens and dozens of adults that were on the set, if they didn't say anything, if my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Yeah, but the documentary alleges that on set, you were informed of this and you aggressively pushed back. Some people even think they got fired because of this. And let's say for the benefit of the doubt, even if they didn't, even if you're like, oh man, I created a shitty environment and they probably just didn't tell me because they were intimidated. Dude, that still makes it on you. If you are running something and you create an environment of pervasive toxicity and people get abused in that environment, that is on you. Every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny, mm -hmm. and only funny. Looking back at them 20 years later through their lens, and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels, let's cut those jokes out of the show, just like I would have done 20 years ago. Or tw Again, multiple people brought up that these jokes were inappropriate. It is great that you feel like you want to cut these jokes now. Awesome. I think a lot of people feel they want to cut jokes that they regret years and years and years ago. 
I would like to cut the entirety of American Pie if I could. I didn't write it. I just want to, you know, that, that movie is not aged well. But there are other allegations around this, Dan. Why are you watching adult content during work hours? Why are you alleging your only female writer to be a call girl surrounded by the male writers after you powwow with them and laugh at her? That's not like, oopsie. That's like, bro. You're fucking crazy. I understand that work environments were way more sexist back in the 90s. But here's the issue. Here's an exchange between Tebow and him. They also highlighted two black actors who said that they felt overlooked. I don't want to speak on anyone's journey. I saw you be honored for diversity in your work. Yes, and the reason for that is diversity has always been very important to me in my shows. If you yeah, that's not an excuse. Even if you did create a lot of diversity, I will not argue that. There are multiple black actors and actresses who felt wronged by you and they're significant parts of your show. They're not like one or two things. There's multiple stories in this about black actors and actresses who heard through the grapevine or who saw your behavior towards them as inappropriate. They're not alleging SA, but they're alleging absolute inappropriate behavior as the adult in the situation on your part. It's great that your friend likes you. It's really frustrating that he brings up that question and immediately undercuts it with, hey, you had the most diverse cast ever to try to shy away from the question. Not cool. That's no good. Taking accountability isn't this, oh, I get to be comfortable and vulnerable and I get to, I get to just feel through my feelings. No, taking accountability sucks. It's not fun. It's supposed to feel like shit, like working out. You're lifting the weights of the crap you gave everybody. And afterwards, you hopefully become a better, stronger person. And everybody else is like, oh, OK, he did the work. Or maybe they don't. Maybe they don't forgive you. But you have to live with that. The last thing I will say is this. Everybody describes this as a Hollywood problem. See, this is the problems in Hollywood. These are what they've been doing to kids. Uh... Jim Caviezel probably thinks there's going to be adrenochrome at some point. Hollywood certainly has a lot of issues, right? I get it. That being said, I'm getting a little frustrated with everybody tying these power dynamics to only Hollywood. What people should have taken away from the Me Too movement and from Harvey Weinstein and all this other stuff, and even Dan Schneider and Brian Peck, is that power dynamics have a lot of inconsistencies and problems. Whenever I see conservatives online go like, oh, Hollywood is a cesspool. Do you know the allegations that have been brought against Crowder and all of those people who have said that? Do you know the allegations that have been brought against Fox and Roger Ailes? I don't even think that's a conservative or white guy problem. I think that is a problem with power dynamics. If you are in a position of power, you have to take accountability that you may not be the most reliable narrator. And if you become a narcissist, it goes out of control. I'll give you one final example before I leave. I had to deal with something similar to this. I wasn't abused or anything like that, but I had to deal with a person in power like this. His name was Mr. Wizard. Mr. Wizard was the head of Evo for a long time. And I will say, Wizard did some incredible things with Evo over the years. He was also very stubborn and very vindictive and power hungry. When Wizard liked you, he would do amazing things for you. I cannot act like my career doesn't have some aspect of Wizard helping me along the way. That's true. Wizard at one point also nearly destroyed my career because of some small misunderstanding of a video I was supposed to edit, and he almost blackballed me from the community. Wizard did this to so many people, and when it came out later on that he had a lot of predatory behavior around his stuff, he was blackballed. And I'll tell you right now, the fighting game scene is a lot better. We seem to be moving forward and progressing in a way we haven't for a while. But people like that who have the biggest position of power and just don't like you or play favorites or are like, hey, I'm doing this big event and it lets me be an asshole to everybody. Those people fucking suck. And I know they suck because after Wizard, years and years and years later, I worked for Philip DeFranco and I worked for Rick Fire. And both of those guys are fucking great. And again, there are frustrating aspects with all of my bosses. I'm sure my editors get frustrated with me sometimes. Mario, if you are frustrated, don't say a fucking word. If you put anything on this screen, if you put a black title card on this screen. But that's what I'm talking about. Power gets out of control when the person doesn't realize that they are human. 
and that the other people working around them are also human and that the minors working around them need to be protected. If you get the privilege of doing a children's show, which is fun and funny and revolutionary and diverse, it is on you. No if, ands, or buts to make that the safest place they could possibly be because you are not only in charge of their well-being, you're in charge of their future. Anyway, that's our show. Let me know what you think in the comments about this whole situation. If you've seen Quiet on Set, how you feel about it, how it affected you. We'll be back again on Sunday with a new Freestyle of the News. Go check out last week's Freestyle of the News. But anyway, my name is Zetabani. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see y'all soon. Let's go!